Hello, hello, and welcome to everybody. I know that'll take a, a few minutes for everyone to join us, but I just wanted to say a big warm welcome to all of you. I'm Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Teaching, Learning, and Tech program at New America. And I want to welcome all of you to the first day of this forum and this workshop. We'll be describing a lot more of what's to come in just a few minutes. We have attendees from around the country who are joining us from libraries, from schools, museums, public television, children and youth media programs, from organizations focused on broadband access to organizations that are focused on teacher and library or librarian preparation um, to parent engagement programs. So it's, it's really exciting to see how many people have RSVP'd for this event and are joining us today. Um, there's just there's a lot to talk about <laughs> in this space for sure. So we've opened the chat so that you can let us know where you are from. Please feel free to take a moment to say hello um, to your to your fellow participants. Um, there will be many people kind of joining in and out as speakers throughout the next 90 minutes. We have an exciting program for you today and we are very thrilled to have FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel with us at the top of this hour, whom we'll officially introduce in just a moment. Um, and one of my colleagues will drop a, a link into the, into the chat here for you so that those who may not have it right in front of you, if you can see the agenda, the agenda is on our events page on our website and you can follow along with that as well. Um, and I also just wanna start by saying a big thank you to the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, which has helped to support this program and a year long project that we're engaged in with our uh, fellow partners on this project, Chicago Public Library, Skokie Public Library and the Schomburg Township District Library. And um, a big thanks to McCormick and to Sean Healy, our program officer, if he's, if he's with us here. I haven't been able to see everyone yet um, in the list, but we really appreciate your support of this project. So just a couple of quick notes about New America um, to get us started, and then we'll move into the program um, and, and about our, our work um, at, uh, in the teaching, learning, and tech program at New America. If you can just get to the next slide, Angela. We are a, um, a think tank at New America. We're focused on building a community of public problem solvers, combining expertise in research, reporting, analysis, but also with new areas of coding and data science and human-centered design. And this particular um, forum is part of our work in the teaching, learning, and tech program, which is part of the broader education policy program at New America. Um, we are focused um, and have been for a couple of years, but we'll be doing even more of this in the coming year on supporting educators, parents, and others as they're using new media and tech with children and students. Um, we see this really as part of um, the equity issues that we're, we're facing right now, really important to be addressing these human-centered um, questions and we'll getting to a lot more of that today. In this particular project, um, we're looking, of course, at what this might mean in informal learning spaces as well as in schools. Um, and you'll be, we'll be talking a lot more about that in a moment. But if you go to the next slide, Angela, I just wanted to show people that we have been focusing over a couple of years now at New America on libraries as part of the education ecosystem. And there's a collection of resources on our website, um, including many articles that have been published in the Atlantic by one of our, our fellows. So if you go to the, um, the next slide, I'll just kind of get us started here and introduce Mary Ellen Messner, who's been a wonderful partner on this project, and she's going to take it from here. Um, she is the uh, acting commissioner for Chicago Public Library. And as you see here, what we've done is we have a project, the Illinois Media Mentor Project, that um, is uh, partnership with Chicago Public Library, as well as the two other libraries noted here, Schomburg and Skokie, and directors from those libraries will be joining us throughout the program. Um, big, big shout out to all of the um, the directors who've been helping me with this project. At Chicago Public Library, in addition to Mary Ellen, Caroline um, Broren, Broren has been um, a huge support, so we want to thank you both. 
And this is something that was originally focused at just Illinois. We thought we'd be meeting in person in Chicago for one of these kind of capstone events, but we have the opportunity now um, to make this something that's available to media mentors around the country and around the world. So we're really thrilled to, to do that. And again, I just wanna say thanks to um, our partners. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Mary Ellen um, to, to kick us off and then to introduce our two uh, keynote speakers. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Lisa. I am so honored to be here with you today. And as Lisa said, we have planned to have this convening in the Winter Garden of the Harold Washington Library. Um, and this is where I work and where I sit today. Um, but I'm so glad we have an even broader reach today for this forum to discuss really a very critical topic. So we started this journey and project a year ago and so much has happened since we began working with our partners. A global pandemic that we're still living through, a social reckoning with the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, an election that highlights deep divisions within our country, remote learning for thousands, hundreds of thousands of students, including um, my twins, and the reimagining of how libraries continue to serve their communities. So we're going to have some really important dialogue over the next several days. I want to start by thanking our partners. So thank uh, Schomburg Township District Library and Skokie Public Library, and of course, New America and Lisa for really shepherding us through this process and never giving up um, as we had several pivots and changes along the way. And lastly, I think I'd like to thank my CPL colleagues who really champion this work. So particularly John Magahas, Lori Frumkin, and Carolyn Brewerin. And um, without, their, without their participation and their jumping in, um, this wouldn't have been possible. So with all of that, um, I can think of no better time for us to engage in this topic of media mentorship and literacy and how we um, help support and inform citizenry. And um, over this year, we had the CPL staff engaged as maybe some of you too, in looking at media mentorship and receiving training we engaged in a book discussion because this is a core of the work that CPL does. So we have over 2,800 computers. Our Wi-Fi is one of the most popular reasons people come to our library. And with everyone pivoting to remote learning, this has been a core of the work that we've done. It's always the work of libraries, but I think in this time, also with so much misinformation and disinformation, understanding how you get those quality resources is the role that all of you play that are um, engaged in this forum and certainly the role of libraries. So we did a lot of pivots and we created a digital toolkit that is available in a really strong partnership with CPS. And I'm really interested over the next couple of days to hear what other educators and, and uh, leaders in this sector have done. Really helping families and students know how the library could support their work, how we can be that navigator, because that's the role that librarians and all other staff that work within CPS. This summer, we had a really successful program, but part of that program was really building out a lot of digital content, right? Something that we hadn't done before. And how do you create high quality digital content that's gonna interest, that's gonna interest and, and attract families and young people who have been doing a lot of these. But this time during the pandemic also has laid bare many inequities uh, that we face you know, across the country, but specifically Chicago. So there's a lot of technological inequity, right? Thinking about how do you engage in remote learning when many students don't have computers? The Chicago Public School has done a yeoman's job in supporting families along, along with the library. We work in this space, not just with children and families, but with our teen program and new media. That is where we introduce a lot of new technologies and teens can explore, they can tell us what they want, and we create and deliver programs uh, that will support that. And then we also are in the adult space. So English as a second language, we have a Chicago Digital Learn, which we built out a whole series of tutorials to help um, kind of entry level um, individuals navigate, navigate the internet, navigate content, 
And we just released this summer a, um, a segment on disinformation. People come to the library as they come to schools, as they come to community centers, because we're a trusted institution, right? So they're looking to our expertise as librarians, as library staff, as educators, to really help navigate this, this, this um, advanced world that we're in, in terms of having, having everything be, for, for us at the time, mostly digital, right? And so finding these ways to connect um, but also educate uh, patrons who come through our doors, but also those, those online. So I hope you have a great couple days. This is gonna be a wonderful dialogue and discussion. I think you'll walk away with a lot of best practices and new ideas. Um, and so I'm excited for everyone to participate in this. We have two dynamic speakers that are really gonna kick us off. So I am going to introduce them and then um, have them start their discussion. So I wanna thank and introduce Jessica Rosenworcel, who is the Federal Communications Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I'm gonna read you just a little bit about um, Commissioner. So she believes in the future belongs to the connected. She works to promote greater opportunity, accessibility, and affordability in our communication services in order to ensure that all Americans get a fair shot at 20th, 21st century success. And I think that's why we're all here today to hear from her, because we believe that too. She believes strong communications markets can foster economic growth, security, enhance digital age opportunities, and enrich our civic life. So we're so happy to have you here, Commissioner. And then also in dialogue, I'd like to introduce Cecilia Kang, who is the um, technology reporter for the New York Times. I was telling her last night, I went online to read a lot of her articles um, and she is, she is truly an expert. Um, so we're, we're um, thrilled that you're here today and kicking us off in this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen and Commissioner Rosenworcel. I'm so pleased to talk to you about this topic because I can think of nobody who's been on it longer and more and with much so much passion than you. So thank you for, for joining us today. Yeah, well, thank you. Those are very kind words, Cecilia. And thank you to New America, Mary Ellen and Lisa for having us here. This is um, exciting to be able to be part of a conversation about media mentorship, libraries, literacy, and honestly, this is such an important time to do it. So kudos to you for holding this event. Yeah, so we can just start off right there, Commissioner. Um, I was hoping you could talk about a little bit about, first of all, like just give an assessment and your observation on sort of the state of things right now. We're about nine months into the pandemic. And, you know, as a huge spotlight has been put on, on the importance of connectivity and, you have long talked about things like the homework gap and digital equity, um, and it's been a problem for years, but now it feels like the stakes are higher. The harms potentially are, are greater when you see children who simply can't learn because they can't connect at home or kids who are sitting in parking lots in the cars trying to get connectivity from their, their libraries, thankfully, um, and other places. Can you give a sense of where the digital divide was and the homework gap, if you will, before the pandemic started and what you're observing now and some of, and what you may project going forward? Ah, all right. That, that is a big, almost yeah. metaphysical question and um, <laughs> for a broadband wonk like me, but here we go. Um, you know, there was a time before this pandemic where Washington treated broadband as nice to have but not really need to have. I think this pandemic has exposed that our nation's digital divide is very real and very big, and also that we have a lot of work to do to fix it, and we better get to it stat. Because during this strange period when we've all been forced home, we've all come to realize that we need that connection to stay in touch with family and friends, for many of us to continue with our workplaces, for students to be able to actually attend school and engage in remote learning, to reach out and maintain connections with our healthcare providers when it might be dangerous for us to physically be present. 
And so what you start to see is so many aspects of commercial and civic life now ride on this foundational infrastructure. So I think as a nation, we have reached this point where we have got to say, it is a national goal to have 100% of us connected to broadband, just like we did it with electricity and water in years past. We've got to recognize that this infrastructure is that fundamental. And you asked specifically about the homework gap, which you know I've talked about for years and years. And before this pandemic, I'd always say, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I needed um, paper, a pencil, and my brother leaving me alone to do my homework. And really, my brother was the hard part. I didn't need an internet connection, but kids today do. Seven in 10 teachers I learned assign homework that requires internet connections, but all of the Federal Communications Commission data say one in three households don't have reliable broadband. So where those numbers overlap is what I started calling the homework gap, just to give a name to that part of the digital divide. And of course, libraries have been so important with regards to that. They're safe community spaces where students can go. But in this pandemic, so many of those public spaces have been shut down. So many coffee shops and fast food restaurants are no longer the places where students can linger and do their schoolwork. So how do we get every child connected at home? To me, this feels like one of the most important questions policymakers have to wrestle with because the consequences of this digital inequity and this homework gap are so, you know, right now during this pandemic, they're just so hard to swallow. It means fundamentally that the classroom is locked to kids who don't have access. And, you know, I'm going on, but you, you saw it, perhaps you saw that viral picture that went around earlier this summer. Um, those two girls sitting outside a Taco Bell in Salinas, yeah. California, right? They were small, they were in little hooded sweatshirts and they had laptops propped in their laps and they weren't there to have lunch, right? They, they were there because that was the only free place that they could get the Wi-Fi signal they needed to connect. And the data show there's 17 million kids just like them in this country who fall into that homework gap. And I just don't think it's an audacious notion to say, we, you know, like that's something we can fix, right? It's not something that we have to settle for in the United States of America. And the way I see it, schools and libraries are part of fixing that, not just in this pandemic, but when we get to the other side. And I think, Commissioner, I think that you would not find many people, even in Washington, a very divided Washington on either side of the aisle that would disagree with you. That is a huge priority. And yet here we are, arguably a couple decades later, and we still, that needle is so hard to move in terms of really fixing, addressing the problem. And I wanna sort of be specific, and it's just, it's cause there's a myriad of problems and hurdles that are in the way. What do you think and what is, well, I should say, what is your priority at the FCC? And what do you think the FCC should do just out of the gate? Out of the Top gate, yeah. That's, a, yeah, no, we need out of the gate ideas. You know, we're gonna need long-term ideas, but we also need short-term fixes. And mm -hmm. when I think out of the gate, what occurs to me is that we need to be smarter about using a program called E-Rate. E-Rate was part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I mean, 1996, I had an AOL account and I was, you know, thinking I was a digital queen, right? It was a long time ago. But back in 1996, Congress decided that libraries and schools across this country should all have internet connections. It's pretty visionary. They saw it was gonna be necessary for the learning that goes on in those institutions. And what's happened over time is the Federal Communications Commission, which manages the E-rate, and help support that internet connection in schools and libraries in every state in the country. We've updated it, we've increased the speeds, but now when I look at this moment we're in, this, this cruel pandemic that has just you know, emptied our public spaces and crashed our hospitals, I say, well, what can we do to update it so it just meets this moment and the current crisis? And it's apparent to me that we can use E-Rate to help our schools and libraries do things like loan out wireless hotspots. And if we did that nationwide, we'd make a meaningful dent in the homework gap and make it possible for more kids to engage in remote learning. And when you look at the reality that we have in the alternative, which is waiting for some other solutions and long-term ideas, I just think right out of the gate, 
we could actually help connect millions of students. And, you know, we used to say um, no child left behind. I think it's a bit more like no child left offline. We could okay. do that really fast with E-Rate. And like you say, right out of the gate, that's one idea. And it involves a program that has been core to libraries and schools since 1996. And is that something that the FCC could do alone or would it need some sort of act of Congress to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the FCC has more than enough authority right now in the statute to go ahead. I do think that in legislation like the HEROES Act, which is in the House, and another bill in the Senate, uh, the Emergency Educational Connections Act, contemplates giving the FCC additional funds to help make this happen. That's good too, right? Let's do this at national scale. Let's, let's do something big. But um, I think what's really important is we get started as fast as possible because I too want this cruel virus to go away. But I think the reality is we are going to have students in and out of remote learning for the rest of this school year. So let's give them a fair shot at getting connected. And would you, do you think there's a role for the private sector commissioner to do something? Like, would, do you think that there is a role for the FCC to really just, you know, use its bully pulpit, pulpit even, or, you know. Yeah, to, to absolutely. Walk? Listen, connecting as many people in this country, you know, by every single way we can. And there've been really creative solutions. I mean, I've seen them in the city of Chicago for instance, how we have the cable providers work with the mayor and the city schools to come up with a way to connect every child. You know, coming up with programs that um, affect an entire town or city are valuable. We're also gonna have to think about students who can't get connected in rural areas. What are we gonna do to help them? You know, can we move school buses into their neighborhoods to provide wireless connectivity in their homes? by making sure it's a Wi-Fi enabled school bus. We can come up with solutions. Some of these will involve the public sector, some will involve the private sector, but let's make it a national priority to fix this problem and do it in short order. And do you think that, um, so right out of the gate, wireless hotspots, great idea, bring them home, kids are online. That's a very specific home or gap sort of solution. What, what will it take to get every home connected, rural and urban? There's a myriad of issues. I mean, frankly, I, I talk to people who call me and say, email me and say, it shows that I have three providers in upstate New York. I, know. I don't have them, you know? I know. Um, I'm familiar with that. When I looked at my own home, I thought, hmm, how is it that the FCC's database says that I have more providers to my house than my you know, lived experience suggests? Um, we've got um, to do a lot better job with broadband data in this country. But um, I also think that we've got to recognize that in the 30s, you know, in the 20s, we had, you know, electricity in our cities. People could turn the lights on. They could listen to the radio. We had automobiles. And we just assumed the farms in the countryside, it would just be too costly to get them there. And, you know, folks came forward and said, oh, refrigeration, there are benefits for farms. But we just said, well, you know, it's just not populated enough. It's just too expensive. But we made it a national project to bring electricity to 100% of this country with the Rural Electrification Act. We decided it was a national priority to reach 100%. And I just feel we have to state that goal out and loud and clearly and say that was the challenge a century ago. This is the challenge today. And we're gonna need a mix of things to make that happen. What works in one area may not in fact be the solution for another, but we have to start with something simple, which is declared a national goal that 100% of our households are connected, just like with electricity and just like with water. And can you talk a little bit, Commissioner, about the sort of the hurdles around adoption? I think when people yeah. hear that bait, some people hear that and they think, what? What's the problem with adoption? Can you explain such, that? Such a good question. You know, we, a lot of times, particularly during this, past administration, when we talk about the digital divide or even the homework gap, we tend to discuss deployment in rural communities and the challenge of getting that infrastructure, you know, to the house down the road, further off than the next one. And that is a real challenge. Let's acknowledge that. And deployment in rural America is something that we have absolutely got to work on. But three to four times as many households in urban and suburban communities are not connected. 
and they largely don't subscribe because they can't afford to, or they have um, a, you know, limited understanding of the relevance of having a really robust broadband connection in their home. And then we've also got you know, students who are living in households where times are tight and the parent might have one phone. Mm -hmm. And that one phone with a data cap needs to be divvied up among every student in that household so they can go to class. We've got to realize there's a failure in that connectivity too. It's not robust enough for what that student needs at this time. So we're going to have to figure out for really address the digital divide. It's not just a deployment challenge, it's adoption too. And making sure everyone has a connection robust enough so that they can go to work, go to school and do whatever their daily life requires. Again, not just in this pandemic, but when we get to the other side, because I think this is changing all of us and changing our patterns of how we can consume and how we create. And those things aren't gonna just go away when we're in some future world where we're all vaccinated. We're not gonna to return to what we thought normal was I think these connections are going to be more important than they were in the past. Absolutely. And I don't want, I wonder, I, I really loved how you were comparing this to the Rural Electrification Act and the parallels of, of history. And it took a, almost a cultural change, a, a change in thinking on the importance. And I and I, I and you started actually, Commissioner, by talking about how it, the attitude used to be that it was a luxury. It was nice to yes. have. It was a night, and I've yes. there's some history on this about this being a luxury and not necessarily a necessity. Um, do you think that minds have changed and minds will change going forward in Washington? The people who are the ones who are in charge of the purse strings, who are creating the policy to make this a top priority. Yeah, you're knitting together my themes like better than I am here. You know, <laughs> thank you for that. But um, yes, I think this is the inflection moment. And I think for those of us who care about this issue, we need to use it as the springboard to get to the next. But I think there is a recognition in red America, blue America, purple America, that every community needs this connection to thrive. And so let's use this crisis moment where we seize what we want the future to be. Like we're gonna use it to be the opportunity to develop a national policy to reach 100%. And I think it's on all of us to call for that. And I know libraries have always been at the forefront of these kind of, you know, these movements, right? To increase uh, democratized access to information. This is really part of that history. And I think it's really important that we all uh, make the most of this moment and change things going forward. Wonderful. And I think, and please tell me folks who are moderating this, who are um, being mindful of the clock, if I'm going over, but I have one last question. Aside from all the things that libraries do already, do you see a role of the library in the future that may be a little bit different or enhanced when it comes to these goals? Well, this is almost not fair. I'm like a massive library lover who goes every week and you know has the ritual. And frankly, during <laughs> during this um, pandemic, when everything's been on screens, the 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 lovely reality of op cracking open a physical book right now is something I've really actually found is comforting during these times. So I'm a fan already. So. But I think libraries are also very important social infrastructure. And now I think they're becoming an important part of our digital infrastructure. Like they're an essential node in how we get information and how we make it available to all. So when I look at the future, I just think the role of libraries is gonna be bigger than before. And I think it is about getting us all connected but also giving us all the tools to be media and digitally literate and not just consume content, but also create it. This is terrific. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for Thank opening you. the forum and for all your thoughts. Thank, thank you both so much, Cecilia and Commissioner Rosenwald. So that was a fantastic conversation. It really hit on so many of the the themes that we're gonna be digging into even more deeply over the next three days. Um, I know that there were some really great questions too that came in the chat and I just want everyone to know we have recorded those. We're gonna be bringing those into the conversation in the next panel. We're not able to have Cecilia and the commissioner with us for much longer as you may see they're, they're leaving the screen already. Um, time is really tight. We were very lucky to get them. But I have recorded those questions um, and we're gonna be kind of looping them in to the conversation um, and I think that some of them were addressed as well during the conversation so uh, 
So thank you and keep the questions coming, everybody. Um, so what we're gonna do now is kind of taking those broad um, themes that we just heard um, and that really do strike at the core of these really big equity issues for our, our country and for what it means for educating our kids and our families. I'm gonna to move to a, a panel discussion that's um, drawing these out a little bit more um, deeply with a bit more detail from those who are really um, on the ground as well as connected to many of these issues in communities and um, in advocating for digital equity. So I wanna, um, start to introduce the three folks who have joined us on the screen. So glad to see all three of you. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the three of you and throw a question to you, um, Paulo, and then we'll get started from there. So, um, and, and again, everybody feel free to kind of follow along in the agenda that's online as well, but you'll see um, we have with us today Paulo Balboa, who is the Manager of Programs and Data for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. And Paulo is also helping us on another project related to libraries um, that um, you'll probably hear more about from me in the, in the near future when we put out some new reports on that early next year. So thank you so much, Paulo, for being with us. We also have with us Carrie Sanders, who is Youth Services Coordinator for the Maryland State Library System across the entire state of Maryland. It's just been an incredible pleasure to get to know Carrie over the years and to see what Maryland um, has been able to do under her leadership. So thanks so much, Carrie, for, for jumping in here. And then um, it's a huge thanks to Dorothy Stoltz, who is kind of a mentor to me on so many of these issues. Um, Dorothy is the Director for Community Engagement at the Carroll County Library in Maryland. She's the author of several books. One of the ones we linked there in the um, agenda is Inspired Thinking, Big Ideas to Enrich Yourself and Your Community, um, a big thinker, but who's also able to really implement on the ground in communities. So thanks so much, all three of you. So I'm going to um, turn it over to you, Paula, to just, I would love to hear your thoughts and reflections on what we just heard from the commissioner and, um, you know, what your maybe hopes are for the near future as it relates to these issues. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I just want to say uh, also thank you for having me on. Uh, it's nice to be here with you, Carrie and Dorothy, to talk about the role of libraries uh, and innovation and digital equity. Um, there are a few, I mean, just uh, Commissioner Rosenberg had a lot to say that I agree with, but a few of the points that she uh, was bringing up uh, was relating this idea that the importance of libraries in the future, right? I think that the commissioner was spot on by saying you know, no one is enjoying this pandemic. No one is having a good time, but there are creative solutions coming up in the world of digital equity to address this, um, to, to address this digital divide. Specifically uh, for public libraries um, uh, in uh, the NDIA's national network, we're seeing um, the deployment of programs that folks are calling digital navigators. In other words, they're taking the role of a traditional librarian, a reference librarian who is there to answer questions from patrons, from community members, uh, and to take their issues, whether they be technological, uh, research-based, or simply communication-based, and do it all over the phone. In this, re in this time of remote learning and uh, social distancing, when we all have to be apart from each other, librarians in particular, uh, folks in Salt Lake City are deploying a digital navigators program to bring on new staff or to rearrange existing staff roles and call them digital navigators so they'll, they'll be able to help community members and patrons over the phone, over screen share, over WhatsApp, whatever makes sense for the patron. One of the things that I love about libraries is that, then, is that librarians are always trying to meet their community members where they are. Right, there's, there's, there's an empathy that goes into the work of the librarian. So what we're, <clears throat> what we're seeing through this digital navigators program is this idea that the community member may not be comfortable with, uh, with certain digital literacy skills. So they may not have access to a device. This is where the digital navigator steps in and says, okay, I need to figure out what, where you need help. And then furthermore, how I can take you to get to where you need. That's so interesting. I actually, I'm, I'm now feeling remiss in not 
adding digital navigators to the guide to media mentorship that we are publishing today, but it's an ongoing process. We'll be <laughs> iterating and um, I'm thrilled to hear, and I'm sure we'll all wanna hear more about that. That concept of navigator, of course, has been around for a while, but more than ever, it's so necessary. Um, and I should know, Paula, I don't know if, um, I had put this into your introduction, but for those who may not know, um, Hala worked in public libraries before joining the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and has done a lot of really creative things that we'll get into in a moment here, I'm sure. Um, let's maybe just, um, before I kind of rope you, all three of you into a conversation with each other, I do wanna go over to, to Carrie and to ask about um, how to think about these kind of equity issues from equity issues from an infrastructure standpoint at the state level and what it's really kind of going to take to start building these networks of support that we're talking about here. Um, and yes, thank you so much, Angela, for sharing the screen to show some of the slides that Carrie and Dorothy will be, will be sharing. Um, but I'll turn it over to you, Carrie, to just describe that from the state level for us. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. And Paulo, thank you. I feel like you almost uh, had already seen uh, uh, the slides that Dorothy and I are going to share because you did a great intro on some of the things that we wanted to touch on. Um, and I'm looking at it from, from the state level where I get that kind of that bird's eye view about what's happening in all the public library systems across Maryland. Um, as well as nationally, I'm, I'm hearing things that are similar. Um, Libraries are responding exactly the way you said. We are navigating these unnavigable waters that we are finding ourselves in. And that's really the key, I think, and, and what we're able to do is to have that pulse on our communities and our customers and meet them where they are exactly as you said, Paolo. And it, and it really comes into wherever that is. We have we have the capacity, so many of our libraries, the staffs do have the capacity to be the, the digital navigator and be able to provide the competencies and the proficiencies with new media and digital media and technology. But there are also so many families that are all on all ends of the spectrum there and we're able to really meet where families are, where, where our children are and learning and, and their comfort with the hardware and the devices and the software. So I, I feel like those three C's, Lisa, that you talk about a lot, I came up with like some different definitions for the three C's that we have that capacity, we have our competency to be that navigator and to be that one. Um, and we also have the compassion to work with whatever um, that beginning point is with our families. And I would say um, that connected learning piece is also in here where we're, we take what, what our, our youth and our families are working on and learning and we can just build and, and move them more for, forward into um, connecting them with, with what they need and when they need it and, and how best to, to work with them. These are just some examples of some of the amazing uh, mentorship opportunities that we have brought to our customers um, through, our, through different tech, tech, uh, technology devices. And then if we can move to the next slide, um, I really feel like too, we are in this pivotal spot with our, our in our communities with partnerships. We partner so much with schools um, always, but especially now to be that, that learning partner, that instructional partner. We work with early childhood providers and um, organizations and uh, obviously our families and community centers. Um, and they're seeking us because even though a lot of our physical buildings have been closed, we've been finding ways to reach our customers still through that virtual connection through sidewalk service, through the chat, through the different um, phones. You know, we're kind of going back. We're looking at everything from years past and what will be our, our touch point to our customers now. But that digital equity piece is huge. And we realize that that is, you know, as Commissioner was talking about, it's, it's where we really need to connect with the disconnected as well as the connected. And public libraries are trying to do that so much um, these days as well. And sometimes that takes on a, a different role than what we've played in the past. We're doing a lot of take home kits and these are some examples from different libraries throughout Maryland. And I know these are reflective of across the country where um, we're providing books in the hands of children. We're taking them in mobile units. We're um, going out to them in whatever outreach capacity we can to put the um, 
put materials in the hands of our our children, whether it's standalone um, activities or they, they are uh, accompanying a virtual program. So um, we're pivoting, we're navigating, we're doing everything we can do to, to try to be there and meet the needs of our families. Um, Wi-Fi hotspots, strengthening our broadband. Yes, those are all happening. Um, we're doing everything we can to be that, that support in our community. And I know Dorothy has some things to share as well to um, really hone in even more specifically on some of the ways we're providing this, this digital uh, support. Yes, and, take it away, Dorothy. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to, to start off by saying that Problems can emerge with digital media and technology uh, when it's used thoughtlessly. And one common example is that it becomes too much of a distraction and it can actually um, shut down learning instead of sparking it. And so from my viewpoint, media mentor and the navigator roles are perfect uh, for libraries. And one way is through makerspace activities. Now, this does not have to be a dedicated uh, space in the library. It could also be um, just through programming, the things we do out in the community to reach those families who are not using the library. Uh, but when we focus in on hands-on learning, uh, whether it's high tech, low tech, or no tech, um, Librarians have an opportunity to shine as mentors, navigators, and learning facilitators. And we can promote deeper conversations about these kinds of challenges and how to solve them so that people are making their own decisions. And libraries can build bridges to models of excellence. So library staff have the opportunity to really lead the pack, if you will, in communities. And one of the ways is to help uh, with critical thinking. And in my mind, that includes promoting great thinkers as models. So say, for example, encouraging a 13-year-old to explore uh, learning about Nikola Tesla or Albert Einstein or Plato and so on. And I know for myself as a 12-year-old, um, I learned about Benjamin Franklin asking himself in the morning, um, what good can I do this day? And then at the end of the day, what good have I done this day? Well, that made a remarkable you know, impression on me and really still inspires me uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. And media mentorship is helping uh, to drive content of our library collections. So people are discovering new and different ideas. So it's helping to avoid that trap of the same old thinking producing the same old results. Uh, the role of the mentor, the navigator, uh, is driving how we interact with our customers and how we design our hands-on activity. So we're hoping that that will help provide that balanced approach to digital and media literacy. Next slide. And my observation uh, is that library staff are bursting with creativity during the pandemic. So in the upper right photo is just a little example of forging some new partnerships. And this is with a farmer um, a, as an online program and a, a very patient Tiffany the horse. Um, and, but we, you know, we have a wonderful uh, compliment recently from the Maryland State Department of Education calling public libraries a godsend. Uh, so Maryland libraries, like libraries across the country, are doing everything we can to find ways to reach uh, customers. And uh, I'm just gonna list a few of them here. Contactless book delivery, virtual story times, Wi-Fi connections, devices to borrow, express pickup, informal tech support, online programming, and the hands-on learning using um, take-home kits. So in Carroll, we have a librarian who created an alter persona, hot dog man. And um, in his hilarious series, um, he focuses on teaching that it's okay to be different. And he shows kids and families how to have fun at home uh, during the pandemic and encourages them to use the library to, to make that happen. 
The other thing I wanted to mention was that Maryland Public Television approached Carrie, myself, and a colleague to sit on an advisory board. And one idea that may become a possibility is uh, bringing take-home kits into libraries that would be connected to uh, a television program. So it's an uh, at-home learning opportunity, but you pick up your materials at uh, your local library uh, prior to the program. Uh, next slide, please. And in 2021, um, Carroll County Library is gonna be opening a 14,000 square foot exploration commons. So it is a tech maker space, a professional teaching kitchen and meeting space. And the project already includes years of uh, programming in the branches kind of leading up to this and getting people excited about uh, the space. And a very popular program is Pepper, the programmable humanoid robot, uh, featured in this demonstration, but also uh, coding workshops with older children. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Association for Library Service to Children for helping us kind of get started with really thinking through our maker activities. They gave us a $1,000 uh, Curiosity Creates grant in 2016. And it also strengthened our partnership with the Boys and Girls Club, who is going to be a major partner in this exploration commons. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you all. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Um, fantastic uh, ideas already popping up in, in our minds, I'm sure, all over the place um, from these great examples. Um, we uh, are running out of time for this particular segment, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift us to our next one and just want to say a big thank you to the three of you um, for being part of this. Um, I did, I failed to mention at the beginning that um, the Maryland, um, many Maryland libraries have been part of a similar media mentorship kind of peer learning program that I was a part of um, a year or two ago now. And so it's really nice to have Maryland and Illinois librarians learning from each other. Um, so thanks so much to, to you all. Um, we now have, and as it, it, in the agenda, what we're, we're trying something new um, here where we wanted to give people a little break but also not um, lose you. So the idea is that we're gonna put up on screen um, an interactive moment, a moment for reflection for you. This is just for a couple of minutes um, where we want you to take a minute to tell us what's on your mind. Um, we're gonna show and share the screen here and we're using Mentimeter. I don't know if you guys have ever done this before. Some of you I think have done it with me at various forums in the past. If all you have to do is go to um, www.menti.com, use the code that's here on the screen, and it will prompt you to just answer this question for us. So we'll put on a little music, we'll take a minute or two to start watching the, the various responses come in, and then we're going to shift into um, some more depth on the media mentorship concept in general. So. <laughs>
participants. It's really fantastic to see their responses coming in. It's a little bit different than seeing it all in chat. Kind of, <laughs> I get a better sense of things, different ideas that everyone's having out there. And I'm noting everything from funding, big, really big questions, obviously, there around funding and the money that it takes to make some of this happen. Um, some of the points made at the beginning of the conversation today. Um, go to that, uh, finding ways to bring subsidies from E-rate and others um, into the equation, but also looking at, you know, what it means to do outreach for immigrant families, um, different language diversity issues, um, professional learning, um, digital literacy for adult learners. So there's, there's a, a, a lot. <laughs> and it's really all connected. Um, and yet we need to make sure we can kind of bite off um, the pieces that that we can um, so that this feels actionable, right? So that there's there's a way to really move forward with what can feel like some, some quite big issues, but there are really positive ways to get some things done. And I think we've got an amazing community of people just right here that are gonna make this happen. So we're gonna move now into um, uh, a, a presentation moment that Claudia Haynes is joining me for. Um, a big thanks to Claudia, who is, um, many of you may know Claudia as the author of the book, Becoming a Media Mentor, along with Ken Campbell. Um, Claudia has been helping with the Illinois Media Mentorship Project and helped us with our summer book study with library staff across three the three library systems in Illinois and is a public librarian in Homer, Alaska. So thank you so much, Claudia. I'm going to get started and we're going to um, go through a few slides here just to kind of acclimate um, folks, um, especially those who may not be as familiar with these these issues and um, ideas. And um, then I'm going to turn it over to Claudia as well. So let me get myself organized here for one moment. Sorry. Um, it's great. So we'll, um, we're going to start with this question of what what is media mentorship? Like for those of you who um, may be new to New America, to this, the public library space that's looking at this issue, there um, are some definitions that we need to start kind of putting up, right? About what, what we're actually talking about. Um, so we have been working to refine that at New America in the public library world has as well. Um, and then there's also connection points to be made in the education space. They may not be using the words media mentor, which is totally fine. There's all sorts of other ways to define this, but that uh, the more that we can um, provide some definition for this, the more that people can see um, how connected things are and how we're, we're all, all kind of rowing the boat in the same direction. So if you go to the next slide, um, what I wanted to do next is to, yeah, sorry, Angela, did you hear me? We can go to the, the next slide. Is it possible to move it to the next one? Let me see if I can get that going. Okay, sorry, yes. Um, so I'm realizing that I was seeing one thing and other people were seeing another, I'm so sorry. So we, um, we wanted to, if you can go back, <laughs> back up one. I'm so sorry, Angela. <laughs> okay, there we go. So one of the things that we um, have been recognizing is there's a lot of different pieces of this um, that are Im important. And we have been kind of refining uh, a definition um, for use at New America, um, both recognizing that it's a human-centered approach for helping people of all kinds, families, students, educators, make informed choices about media. Um, but it's not about having a one size fits all approach. I'm so sorry about my dog. And yes, I knew that was going to happen. Um, and it's really about recognizing that um, we can do this kind of mentorship in ways that are not being um, dictatorial. We can be empathetic and not preachy. Um, so to the next, but yeah, next slide here. So what we wanted to do was um, really get this down to this definition, that media mentorship is modeling and providing tailored guidance in selecting, analyzing, and using media in ways that support literacy, learning, and engagement. And if you saw earlier in the slide um, previously, we also were recognizing that media does not have to mean just digital media. Obviously, right now, a lot of our conversation is so focused 
on online resources and digital media, but it can also be things like what's on a t-shirt or the messages that we see on billboards um, or just the way signs and images are constructed. And that starting to recognize media and across that kind of broader spectrum will help librarians and educators and others who want to build these skills recognize how they can make connections to all sorts of different um, messages as they're, as they're working with families and working with students. So if you go to the next slide, what we've done is published today this uh, guide. It's four pages long, fun to make it really short and sweet, um, easy to, to navigate, that is bringing together a lot of the resources that you've started to hear about already today, um, including the incredible work that Claudia has done um, in the book, Becoming a Media Mentor, including um, many different work, white papers and um, peer coaching toolkits that have been produced by my colleagues in Maryland, but bring it all into a pretty easy to read um, primer, uh, you know, Media Mentorship 101 for everyone to, to take a look at. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that one of the things that we've been really focused on in this particular piece is the recognition that um, media mentorship is a key component of digital equity. So it is, it is necessary but not sufficient for today's families to have broadband access and devices. Those are important, but without having a librarian, educator, a mentor, someone in their orbit who can help them use these tools to connect in ways that are meaningful, we um, are not, not, we're not gonna be getting there um, for a lot of families today. So the digital navigator concept that Paula was mentioning earlier is really, um, really strikes at the heart of this as well. Go to the next slide. We also are really um, focused in our work these days on what many of us are seeing as a huge looming problem and that is, how to um, cope with issues of misinformation and disinformation. And of course, we'll need technological fixes for that perhaps. We certainly may, um, we need to be thinking differently about, and we have been for um, uh, a year or so or more now on content moderation or what role the content providers and social media networks have to play. But in addition to those kinds of solutions, we also need an education and a learner-oriented solution to the problem of misinformation and disinformation and just how people are coming to understand the streams of media that um, are appearing on their phones every day or, or in their um, routines every day. And so we see that media mentors can be a really important part of the answer, part of the education ecosystem, because they're providing really tailored as we mentioned earlier, you know, tailored advice and guidance, but that is not um, kind of presupposing that there's one right way to do something. And that instead is recognizing what the questions are that that parent or that educator or that student has. And then modeling what it looks like to, to find the answer, what it looks like to ask a question about the source of a document, what it looks like to decide that one um, piece of media might be of higher um, quality than another piece. Um, and the media mentors are the ones who can really help to show what that looks like so that people can start to think for themselves and make their own decisions about the information that's coming at them. So if you go to the, the next slide, one of the things we're interested in doing is promoting this through, of course, policy change, practice change, of recognizing the need for much more professional learning. These are all, these are seven actions that are in that report um, brief that, that um, we've just published today. I won't go into all of these here, but just know these are things that we at New America will be continuing to push on and work on. And we're looking for um, allies across the board to help to, um, to raise these issues um, and make sure that they're part of the education policy um, landscape as well as the technology policy landscape. Okay, and then the next slide, please. So one of the things that um, has been just such a treat um, to be um, involved in from the, from the get-go is to be meeting and learning from so many of the public librarians who took this issue on um, with 
just incredible vigor from the from the beginning um, in the in 2010, 2011, 2012. A lot of these issues were already bubbling up then. Claudia um, was one of the key people, um, as well as Dorothy, who you mentioned, or uh, we've met earlier, Amy Kester, who you'll meet tomorrow, um, and others. And there was a paper that came out from the um, Association of Library Service to Children called Media Mentorship and Library Serving Youth that Claudia was part of. And I'm now gonna pass it over to Claudia to take us through the rest of the slides. And then therefore you also don't have to hear my barking dog. So again, thanks Claudia and over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Next slide, please. So when we wrote the book, Ken and I wanted to build on the white paper that Lisa just mentioned and highlight examples of media mentorship in action and document what this evolving practice needs to be successful. And so this book was written primarily for library staff, but it was meant to honor and reflect the variety of voices that kind of what Lisa mentioned that were from education, research, and public policy that were integral to the birth of media mentorship. And many, many of you are here today. So hello, everyone. The intention of the book was to present four big ideas important to our work as media mentors and ultimately how we support families. The big ideas are research guides our practice, the three Cs, which are a framework that Lisa's brought to the field, recognizing the power of content, context and child when deciding how to use media with kids. And then the third idea is family engagement. And the fourth idea is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. And so we apply these big ideas when we intentionally interpret and share current research about the ever-changing technology and kids when we communicate in ways that increase family engagement around different types of media to support human connection. You saw some examples of that from Maryland. Um, and when we evaluate and curate high quality media of all kinds and help families grow their own media literacy skills. When we provide families equitable supported access to high quality traditional and new media so they can get the information they need to live and learn. And then finally, when we design and implement innovative research guided experiences that provide new entry points for learning how to create and communicate with a variety of media. Um, something that the commissioner pointed out and really amplifying the voices of youth and their families. Next slide, please. And so as we surveyed work being pioneered by library staff, we identified three important types of intentional media mentorship that incorporate those really big ideas, right? So media advisory, which was traditionally known as reader advisory, supported access to curated media, and of course, programming. And so in 2016, Ken and I had no idea something as big as a public health crisis layered with intense social discourse would come along to further reveal the cracks. Let's be real, canyons in families' digital access and media literacy skills. But what we know and do as media mentors applies now more than ever, as others have mentioned. And so let's take a look at the three types that we identified. So next slide, please. So in media advisory, we connect families with the information they need and want. That information is certainly found in books, but also in content available from community partners in digital formats like eBooks, video games and apps curated by the library and in programs hosted in the library and around town. And so we provide media literacy um, as was exemplified in the, in the digital navigators during in-person conversations on the phone, in emails, in live chat, in social media posts, and even at the grocery store. Media advisory, can be more successful when the advisory flows both directions and library staff are listening to the recommendations, resources, and interests that families and youth share. Next slide, please. So how do we decide what we recommend in these media advisory moments? So alongside the discussion about the lack of diversity in young people's literature, 
a parallel conversation has been happening around digital media for young people. And I teamed up with colleagues at KIDMAP, which stands for the Kids Inclusive and Diverse Media Action Project to create a checklist that helps media makers and consumers create and select media that reflects and supports our communities in a much more inclusive way. The idea is to help us recognize our biases and blind spots in regards to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. And so um, you'll see here some different images that represent parts of the checklist. And so the checklist highlights the ingredients that make up high quality digital media organized into eight categories that you can see on the slide. So content and information, art, creative team, audio, audience, purpose, functionality, and even what grown up support exists. So the checklist can help us with another aspect of media advisory empowering youth and their grownups to evaluate and select new media on their own, an important part of media literacy, and thus be media mentors for themselves. Okay. Next slide, please. And so I don't know if you recognize these um, recently created or published images. They're from NAMLI, which is the National Association of Media Literacy Education, who you're gonna hear from during the forum. And they recently created these characters, the media monsters and messaging to help young people evaluate media on the fly as they consume, create and share it. And so it got me thinking, how can we similarly support youth in our work with families in small media literacy moments and as part of big initiatives? So that's a question to ponder these few days. Next slide, please. So the second type of media mentorship is something um, really brought up in, in, with the commissioner. Um, this is this access to curated media, which certainly includes providing computer or tablet use and the internet connection they require, but it's much more. So media mentors also provide the know-how to successfully use these devices and platforms so that young people and their families can access and create the content they need and want. So it's not just the actual tech, but how to use that tech successfully for school, um, for filling out you know, government forms or whatnot. Next slide, please. So media advisory and access often merge with the third type of mentorship that I mentioned, which is programming. And so these in-person and virtual programs for young children who I lovingly refer to as littles and their families were designed with current research in mind, encourage family engagement around media, provide equitable supported access to high quality media and the skills necessary to use it effectively. So littles don't usually come to programs on their own. As you know, thoughtful programs for littles can actually capitalize on the presence of their grownups or older siblings who also attend and the whole family can learn new digital and media literacy skills together in really low risk experiences. Next slide, please. So these in-person and virtual programs for older kids offer new entry points for learning how to create and communicate with a variety of media, provide access to an array of authors, illustrators, and other makers who share their expertise, and embed media literacy moments into creative learning experiences. So we're kind of exemplifying how these big ideas and these, these moments, what they look like. And so these programs might involve more sophisticated tech to host the program like Zoom or as the focus of the program like green screens and computer programming. Next slide, please. And these in-person and virtual programs create opportunities for teens to discuss and evaluate their favorite media, support teens as media makers so they better understand how different types of media work, and empower teens as media mentors for their peers, near peers, and families. And I think we're going to delve into teens a little bit more after this. But these programs often include even more sophisticated skill building, amplify youth voice, and can be led by grownups or led by teens themselves with grown up or institutional organizational support. Last slide, please. 
And so I leave you with this big question to think about over the next couple of days. So applying media mentorship to our work, how can we continue to strengthen individual families and whole communities? So thanks, I'm so glad to be part of this big national conversation with you all. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, really great food for thought. And we're gonna move now to something that really does um, nicely segue from those last couple of slides where you were describing what librarians can do with teens. And I want to, if, I'm not sure if he's here yet with us, if, if we have Nigel White um, and Angela, feel free to let me know if, if we may need to wait a moment more um, for Nigel to join us. But we are going to hear about how a library in Connecticut has been able to work with its um, with youth in the community outside uh, Hartford to provide you know, some really cool programming for those teens, so that they have um, a chance to learn not only how to make media but also be more discerning in how they're consuming media as well. So, oh, fantastic, great. I'm so glad to see you, Nigel. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, let me kind of officially introduce you. So, um, really thrilled to have Nigel with us. He is the U Media Program Coordinator at the Hartford Public Library in Connecticut. Um, U Media is a, there are many U Media programs um, around the country and those from Chicago know that it really got um, huge start in Chicago. The Chicago Public Library is a, a wonderful source for UMedia programming. Um, but we happened to come across Nigel at a media literacy meeting last year run by the National Association for Media Literacy Education. And I was so captivated by what he's been doing with the youth in his program and wanted to bring him on um, to describe a little bit more about it. So Nigel, welcome. Do you mind telling us just a little bit more about your program and um, you know, introducing us to um, what the environment's like there at Hartford in your program? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. Um, thank you to New America. Um, and so, uh, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm from Umedia Hartford, uh, where uh, we are a teen serving uh, center and program. Um, we focus on ages 13 to 19, um, and then we kind of dive into that young adulthood um, up until age 21. Um, so most of what we've been doing, well, I'll say this, uh, we got started with uh, media literacy about uh, a little more than a year ago, actually almost two years ago now. Um, and it was something that we were looking to engage our youth with, but didn't necessarily, you know, have a full plan um, yet until we actually, you know, were able to meet um, and connect with the organization called IREX out of Washington, D.C. Um, we connected with IREX um, at the beginning of 2019. Um, actually, the previous program coordinator for UMedia uh, had made the connection and then passed it on to me. Um, and with that being the case, myself and another colleague, uh, Catherine, at our public library, we were able to build that connection with IREX um, to a point where they were interested in um, having our support and our help with uh, redeveloping or developing an adaptation of their Learn to Discern guide. Mm -hmm. um, so they had this very thick, um, very long, um, in a sense, curriculum um, that was more so geared towards adults. Um, and they wanted some some um, support from us in redeveloping that so that it could be something that was more appealing um, and, and engaging for teens and young people. Um, so with that being the case, uh, we, you know, we took on that challenge gladly and um, up through the summer of 28, uh, excuse me, of 2019, um, we had been working on doing, um, take, taking that, that curriculum that has learned to discern um, and working with some of our interns who were helping us to kind of work on the programs and the um, activities that were inside of that curriculum. And um, once we took those, once we practiced and, and worked with those activities, they would give us their feedback on what they thought would work and not work for their peers or folks younger than them. Um, that pretty much led us to um, the opportunity to present at the NOMLI conference in 2019 in June, um, where we gave a quick sample of what our podcast, our upcoming podcast was going to look like. Um, again, with the support and, and features from two of our interns. Um, 
with that being the case, um, I, I was glad to meet Lisa and some other folks um, who seem to be um, to, to very much enjoy what we were looking to do. Um, and even at that point, we weren't um, fully, you know, it wasn't fully vetted the whole program and our, our ideas for the podcast weren't, you know, fully thought out yet, but we did have a general uh, layout and outline for what we're aiming to do. Um, at this point, um, we have started our podcast and actually started releasing episodes. Um, one, one that we actually have a quick sample for you all to show. Um, so uh, if we could show that, I would be glad to, you know, show you all that and then we can go on and explain a little bit further. What's up, y'all? It's Lee. It's D. With the, the T. So today we're going to get into it just because I felt like it should be talked about. Because in my city, a lot of you, not even only you, because grown men, get into a lot of altercations with guns, fighting, gang violence. So I wanted to get into the death of King Juan and how that came about. So recently around Wednesday... Yes, so again, that was a quick little snippet, but I just wanted to give you all just a quick idea of what it looked like for a second. Um, you can check more out on our UMedia uh, Instagram page, UMedia HPL, and on our UMedia uh, YouTube page, UMedia Hartford. Um, but that came about um, after a couple of different trials, um, whereas we had young folks who were, again, doing the trainings um, and activities that were a part of the Learn to Discern curriculum. Um, with the, the insight that we had previously gotten from our interns. Um, so the young people really enjoyed those. Um, well, no, I would say the young people really learned a lot from those, but it was hard to, to gain a sense or, or recognize a sense of enjoyment from those young folks that were involved in the trainings. Um, so with that um, came the opportunity for us to figure out how else do we reach these young people and actually allow them to enjoy themselves while learning about media literacy and everything that comes with it. Um, so from that point, we again, developed the podcast idea um, and we decided that as we were helping our young folks to develop this podcast and their segments, um, because we have multiple segments, but as we were helping these young folks to develop their different segments and what would go into, it, into them, um, we got the idea of, well, why don't we just incorporate the lessons of media literacy and media as, as you all are calling it media mentorship right um into uh the preparation for their podcast segments right mm -hmm. so um a lot of what you media is about at least you media hartford is about is of course providing access to equipment uh different supplies um and just access to different ideas that that some of our young folks might not have otherwise um you know been engaged with um, but in that, I think one of the big focuses for me, at least, um, is teaching our young people how to not only be consumers of media, right, but to be uh, creators of media and, and to understand that they have infinite possibilities as to what they can do with their lives, their careers, their educations, et cetera, um, just by understanding what it takes to, to um, be engaged with media, media successfully and safely, right? So. Um, some of the things that we learn from the, the um, learn to discern curriculum are pretty much the same things that we're continuing on and, and making our basic principles as far as this podcast and preparing for it. So some of those things include um, understanding the media, la the landscape, understanding the media landscape, what uh, media literacy means, um, what is included in media, because that is a very uh, broad term, yeah. right? Um, and understanding the power of media. Um, coming with that, um, in addition, is understanding what misinformation and disinformation is, right? And how certain things can be manipulated for different reasons. Um, and again, what power that carries. Um, and then lastly, fighting misinformation. So understanding how to um, do research, understanding how to, um, you know, follow up on sources and not just take the first source that you find and run with it, right? Um, because as we've learned with a lot of our young folks, um, especially with social media, as soon as they see something, 
that for them, if it's something that's appealing to them, they may feel instantly gratified and not even feel the need to go and search further, right? Um, that to them, it's in, in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, it's I have this information, Instagram has showed me a meme, that's all I need to know, right? So again, teaching them um, how to be creators as well as consumers of media while understanding the media landscape, while recognizing the difference between misinformation and disinformation, and while understanding how to push back and fight against misinformation. Um, so now, again, as you all have seen, we have actually started our podcast. Um, still a couple of different, you know, areas to kind of touch up on and get better at. But that's pretty much where we are right now, especially with the time of COVID. That's pretty much where a lot of our focus is going into. I have to say, Nigel, it's impressive to be able to get something going in the age of COVID, to be able to have um, your young people really working, like, together and towards these kind of broader themes and projects while they're also managing all the stress and anxiety of like, you know, even getting to these places and, you know, wearing the mask and not wearing the mask and what, um, what does this mean in terms of interaction with each other and um, I, having teenagers, I know that it's a lot, <laughs> um, but really fun to see those two young women on on screen for a moment there. Um, I've got a quick question for you, but I also um, want to encourage folks to put questions into the Q&A for, for Nigel or into the chat as well. And then there were a couple of questions that were coming in around kind of broader digital equity issues that I want to just raise up as well before we close. Mm. But my first question for you, Nigel, is if you could just give me a sense of how you got the podcast started in terms of connecting it to these themes of media literacy, understanding where your media is coming from. Because um, I know that when we met um, a year and a half ago now, these were already themes that were on your mind, but the, the two young men that I met, they were focused and did some awesome work, but they were focused on music, right? And, and really kind of creation of music. And it wasn't as obvious at first and for them, maybe it was in different ways, but it wasn't as obvious at first when what the connections would be. So talk to us right. a little bit about how to kind of make those connections when they're, when they're producing something. So for, well, I'll, first I'll go back to the two young folks that, that you met, um, Tyrus and Tariq. Uh, and again, as you said, they were mostly focused on creating music, the content itself, right? Um, but I think the way that, that I approached, and again, some of the other mentors had different methods as well, but the way that I typically approached um, that media mentorship, in a sense, with them was to help them understand and, and focus on what it is that they're consuming first, right? And that's why I say um, creators and consumers, you know, not that I'm looking for being media creators to, to, to overshadow the, the consumption aspect, um, but teaching them to understand what they're consuming first and foremost, right? So, Cyrus and Tariq happen to be two young folks that that once you build that, and as many young folks, once you build that relationship with them as as somebody that they look up to for whatever reason, it's it's almost like a lot of times what you're saying is like gold to them, right? Um, and again, whether I think it should be or not, that's a different story. But um, they would take we, we would we would first you know sit down together and, and talk about um, as we started talking about the podcast, what did they want to present in their podcast, right? Um, what types of topics would they want to discuss? And in that, of course, they were always talking about music or this artist and that artist, which is great. But um, the difference was, well, excuse me, not the difference, but the, the thing that I was looking to change or raise um, as a concern in their minds was, what was all of this music and what were these artists saying to you, right? So um, in a sense, literally being able to understand the content that they're receiving and not just nod your head to a beat or something that sounds catchy, right? So um, that in itself was literally the beginning of where we started with understanding the media landscape. And then, um, you know, we would get into conversations at, about, um, okay, do you feel this artist? Now, again, we're, we're talking, we're, we're engaging as if you know, we're, we're not, I'm not at work and they're not in a team program in a sense, but as if we're out on the avenue somewhere, right? Um, because that's where we're all from. Um, so again, that mentorship aspect carried over into the library where it's, okay, what do you think about this artist? Uh, do you think they're being real? And, you, and that was another activity that we had as, 
as we ad, uh, adapted the learning, learn to discern curriculum. Um, is it real? They called it, is it real or not? Right. So being able to take somebody's information or what somebody's saying and analyze it for what, in whatever ways and understand, do you feel like they're, they're keeping it real? Right. Um, so keeping it real to our young people um, is something that's, that, that holds a lot of weight. But at the same time, if I were to say something like, um, is this misinformation or not? Right. They initially, they, it wouldn't click. Right. So it was just about connecting those different terms um, or those the, the the definitions of these terms to phrases that they already knew or ideologies that they already knew about, right? Um, or that they looked at in just a different way. Um, so with the, the interns or the young people since then that we've worked with on the podcast, especially, um, it's really been about, te again, teaching them these different principles of media literacy as as they are already building up whatever it is that they're building up. So for example, the young people, again, that we've been working with, the two young ladies that you've seen on the screen, they have a third partner actually. Um, but the three of them, whenever I'm working with them on a weekly basis, say, okay, now today's the day, you know, you guys have to come up with your, your, your topics for the next segment, right? They're coming up with their topics. And of course it, it has to be whatever that, whatever they're interested in, right? It can't be something that I'm saying, oh, you should talk about this now, figure out a topic to talk about this type of theme. Um, it's what they're interested in and their peers would likely be interested in. So with that being the case, we're gonna address, we're gonna, we're gonna attack this issue and we're gonna address this issue, but then we're gonna talk about, do you think it's uh, misinformation or not, right? Di a misinformation, disinformation or not, right? Do you think it's factual? Why, right? So now we can figure out um, how to dive into the different tools and the different resources that allow us to understand and allow us to learn how to fight back against misinformation or disinformation. Right, um, but at the end of the day, we're we're starting with topics and things that they want to discuss or engage in, um, and I think ultimately that's, in my opinion, that is the starting point for, or should be the starting point for any work with youth and teens, especially, um, because the teens are at are becoming or getting to that age if they aren't already there, where they're thinking for themselves and not necessarily looking for somebody else to tell them what to think or what to feel, right, and so instead of trying to change that, um, we feed into it, right? And then we, 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 it's almost about figuring out how to dive into and when to dive in um, in order to kind of redirect their attention to the point you're trying to make. So smart. I mean, just that just really important point that you're making about starting where the students are, where the kids are, where, what they really are interested in, what they want to know, and instead of throwing a bunch of glossary terms at them and telling them here's the definition, right, which I think is what some of us might think is a, a, the first thing we're supposed to do. Um, so thank you so much, Nigel. I, I'm going to answer a couple of the other quick questions that came in. Um, they're not as specific to your um, work. Um, related here. So I'll let you feel free to, to, to move off. But I want to say there's a lot of enthusiasm for what you're doing. And we're so glad to have you with us. Um, <clears throat> and I know we're coming up on the end of our, our 90 minutes here. So I just want to um, quickly address, there were some really some good questions in the chat about um, kind of figuring out how to do kind of afford the affordability issues related to hotspots. Um, and even the broad question about broadband access as a utility, which we didn't pointedly ask the commissioner, um, but I have heard those, you know, those points referenced before. And so we'll have to see over the next month or two. Um, I mean, there's going to be some really huge opportunities for the FCC with new appointments um, under the Biden administration. And we'll see if some of those broader points about broadband um, and digital access being kind of more of a utility really start to take hold. Um, I also want to note that some, uh, one of our participants asked about getting into some questions that affect our college students. And that's a really um, important issue as well. Most of this forum will be focused on kind of 12th grade and younger um, in terms of the experts that we've brought on, but there are applications obviously um, up through the years. And one of our speakers tomorrow works with the, has worked with adult learners on media literacy, Jamika Anderson. So she'll have some points for you there. Um, so I'm going to start to close us out. I, we have a short survey that we're hoping um, you'll take a minute to respond to. And I think we're gonna put that in the chat here um, for everybody. Um, 
Um, oh yes, okay, so that's a survey. So thank you, Fabio. Um, that's for a different project, but I also we would love to have you take that survey as well. Let me let me grab the link, a survey just about today's um, event and we'll have one, it's just one or two questions for you. And then we're also um, really looking forward to seeing you all in, um, you know, in 24 hours or less at the second day of this. We have some fantastic speakers from the Tech Center at Erickson Institute, from, from Namely, um, uh, many of our library partners will be in conversation with others. Um, and we are hoping you will join us for that. So let me quickly grab the link to make sure I get, get that survey out to all of you um, and continue sending us your questions, um, continue kind of letting us know what you think and what you want to hear about, um, because we do have time to kind of workshop this and get even more um, uh, into more depth of what you need as educators, as librarians, um, as people who are running programs, and hopefully we'll be able to um, be even more targeted in answering your questions. So um, I've put the, uh, the link to today's quick questions in the chat there um, for day one. Um, if you could take a minute to respond to that, we'd love it. And I'm going to say a big thanks to everybody who came today and to our speakers. Um, and I'll let you all let you all go. And I'll see you tomorrow at uh, three o'clock central time. Um, and the links are all in the agenda there. So make sure you can get to the next day. Thanks so much, everybody. And 